Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. Good morning, Crossroads. Man, there's a bunch of you guys here. Happy Labor Day weekend. You guys take a day off tomorrow? No? What's wrong with y'all? Oh, well, I am. Somebody gave me a trip to go to Alaska to go fishing. Poor me. To go salmon fishing. So I think it's going to be fun. Catch me on the back end because I'm supposed to be bringing home like 50 pounds of salmon or halibut or something. I have no idea what's going on. I just said yes. We are in the middle of a series entitled Dirt. And this is our third talk in the series. And this morning's message, man, it's just, I got too carried away in the first service. So I just got to calm down, okay? Because I don't feel like I communicated what I wanted to communicate. But I do know this that the majority of us that are going through stuff right now um, are going through it, and we just need a little tweak to reframe some stuff in our lives according to God's word so that we can see ourselves overcoming rather than buried. Amen. 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 So let's take a look at We're in Mark's the four, Mark's, Mark the fourth chapter. <laughs> We're talking about the parable, the seed, and the sower. The title of this morning's merit message is, Carry On My Wayward Dirt. <laughs> Every time I thought about this passage, I thought about that song from Kansas. Anybody know it? Yeah. Carry on my. Oh, man, you guys. Come on, Levi. Don't you cry, no. <laughs> okay. So I should have asked the guys to do that song. It would have been so good. We all came from the dirt. We're all going to wind up in the dirt, and from now until then, we have to contend with the dirt that's all around us, primarily in our own lives, amen. When I was a kid, I was asked, uh, I was in this first grade, I went to Weinert School, we were the Wildcats, everybody's a matador now, which is not, it's not good, you got to promote yourself to become a matador, but anyway, everybody wins prizes now, but back then, we were a Wildcat, <laughs> and uh <laughs> Uh, I remember going, and it was, it was early morning, and it, was, it had just rained that morning. And by the time we got to recess or PE or whatever you call that, first grade, remember, I'm like, how old am I? Six? Yes. Okay, six. And the teacher, Ms. Smith, said, whatever you do, just don't go on the playground area because, you know, it's, it's dirty. It's, it's, it's muddy over there. It's like, okay. So we were all excited to go outside. We went outside. And what did I do? I go to the playground area. Because that's what Marcus does. I'm curious. And so I, I saw the, the pull-up bars. And I'm like, and I saw, you know, in the middle, whenever you go right down underneath the pull-up bars, uh, it's just nothing but mud. But I wanted to climb it. I mean, just jump on it, swing, and swing to the other side. So I would miss it. And I'd be free. And it'd be awesome. And it didn't happen. So I swung, and I got the bars, and then I wound up slipping, and bam, right on my face. I mean, I am just full of mud as a seven-year-old. <laughs> just crying. Weenie. I was a weenie. <laughs> and, man, you know, I had an opportunity, so Miss Smith came out there. She rescues me. At that time, you have a first-grade class that actually has water and sinks inside of it inside of the classroom. So she wiped me all up, cleaned me all up. And I had an opportunity to either go back home and face the music with my parents and get cleaned up and change clothes or just remain dirty and just wipe my face and hands and just stay in the class. And so I decided to go ahead and go back home so that I can change my clothes, of course, crying to mom again. I was mama's boy and uh, came back. But so uh, anybody ever done something like that before? <laughs> You're lying. Here's what I know about all of us. All of us have fallen on our face at some time or another. All of us have done something in life that we weren't supposed to do, and we wound up getting hurt, or we wound up getting embarrassed uh, because we took a chance and didn't do what we're supposed to do. Isn't that true? And during those moments in our lives, we have an opportunity to do one or two things as well. Face the music and get clean, you know, or, you know, just confess and openly confess and and, and restore ourselves and, and get back up and keep on going. And so this morning's message, this morning's topic that we find in Mark's uh, gospel, the fourth chapter, reminds me of that. It reminds me of the idea that, man, I may have fallen, but that doesn't mean that I've been forgotten. That I may have been buried or bruised, but that doesn't mean that I've been buried. 
you know, the, the enemy came to bruise Jesus. And it seems as though that bruising, I mean, he's just, he didn't want to stop at just bruising and beating him. He wanted to take him all the way down to the grave and bury him. And sometimes we feel that way, don't we? We feel like, man, this, this hurts. As a matter of fact, I'm going to die. This is not good. Anybody ever been there? You may go through hard times, but I want you to understand that you will rise again. You will rise again if you pay attention to what you're hearing in the middle of all that dirt and all that grind because God does his best work in the dirt. The battle's always in the dirt. So in this series, we've been talking about different ideas. Dirt is all over the scripture. As a matter of fact, God told Adam, hey, I want you, you're, you're supposed to be a gardener. You need to cultivate this dirt. It was uh, Jacob that wrestled with God in the dirt. It was Jesus that took a blind man and spit on the ground, made some dirt, throwing it on his, on his eyes that healed this man. Dirt is all over scripture. As a matter of fact, the whole gospel message is a gospel message of dirt, how a clean God came and became dirt on our behalf so that we who were dirt would become clean. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Over and over and over and over again. You guys are clapping this morning. Good. <laughs> You can bring your white handkerchief. That's great. So let's go to Mark's gospel, the fourth chapter, and let's just take a look at this idea called the wayside dirt. Before I do, little Johnny had to go to jail. And while he was in jail, you know, they had a farm, and his wife was going to try to take care of the farm while he was away. And she's not a very good farmer. As a matter of fact, she's a horrible farmer. But she decides to write little Johnny. He goes, hey, Johnny. He goes, I want to plant some potatoes in our potato field. Johnny Wright gets the letter, reads it, writes her back, goes, don't get close to that potato field. That's where I hit all my guns. That's where I hit all my stuff. Don't go there. Well, the police and the detectives and those that were overseeing him, you know, they have to investigate. They, they look through all of his, his, uh, his mail, and they censor all of his mail, and they found out what he was saying. So what did they do? They take off for the next two days and they go to that far, that, that field and dig everything up. For two days, they couldn't find anything. Little Johnny writes back to his wife. He goes, okay, honey, now it's time to plant <laughs> the potato fields. I love little Johnny. He's an amazing guy. Somebody just told me the other day, he goes, oh, something about little Johnny jokes. Anyways, you know, we had a guy move in across the street to our house, not to our house, but across the street. And out of, he has a little, little boy and a out of, real cute little boy, curly hair, red hair. And out of all the names, say, hey, what's your name? Little Johnny. It's like, what? Are you serious? I thought it was awesome. Listen, the scripture says in verse 3, behold, a sower went out to sow. And it happened as he sowed. Some seed fell among the wayside. Say wayside. wayside. It's not wayward, it's wayside. <clears throat> and the birds of the air came and devoured it. Mm. Birds of the air always talk about just the enemy how the Satan comes immediately. He's trying to do what? Mm. Trying to steal, kill, destroy, but he's primarily after the word of God. Mm. He hates the word of God. Why? Because it's, it's, it's God's word that transforms people's lives. Right. Right. I hope that that's why you're here. Not just because amazing music and worship and, you know, you've got a great Mexican pastor, all that good stuff. <laughs> you're primarily here because of God's word. Um, because it's God's word that will transform your life. I can't transform you. A song can't transform you unless it's filled with God's word and backed up by the anointing of God's spirit. Because we've seen that happen. Even in David's life, as he worshiped, man, demons fell. We see that throughout all of scripture. But it's God's word that when it's planted, and it's planted in the right type of soil, man, it'll bear fruit in your life, in your family. It'll make a difference. It's the game changer in our lives, amen? So he goes on, Jesus said, gives him that parable, then he goes on to explain it. And he said, don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? In other words, this parable is so important. There's so much truth in here. There's such a, a great life principle that if you don't get this, you're not going to be able to understand the other parables that I'm going to be speaking to you. He who has ears to hear, let him hear, he goes on to say. So then he begins to explain. Verse 14, he says, the sower sows what? The word of God, right? And then it gets, oh, look at that. And these are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown. 
when they hear, Satan comes immediately. Seven o'clock every night, after a day or two, after they have time to think about it. No, it says he immediately comes as soon as it's sown, and he takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. I talked to the men yesterday, and uh, this was the first type of soil that we're looking at. And basically, these four types of soil are the conditions of a man's heart when he is in the position to receive God's word or God's, you know, God's uh, voice. And what kind of a soil are you? The first one was way, wayside soil. <clears throat> and it's important that you don't have, you know, shallow soil, that there's no, that you can, you have soil that takes root. It's important that you have, uh, you don't have seduced soil, the cash, uh, the cravings, you know, all this stuff will try to get the best of you. You got to have soil that's good soil so that it can, it can go and penetrate deep into your heart and God does his best work on the inside. But it takes time, right? It's not the speed of light. It's the speed of a seed. The speed of light, we all want it right now. Come on, man, just microwave this thing. Let's go. I'm tired of this. But the speed of a seed has a process. And we have to understand that we have to allow and yield ourselves to that process in order to bear fruit Good. as God intended and fruit that remains. Amen. He wants us to have great fruit, not shallow. Amen? Amen? So the wayside soul, let's talk about that. The wayside soul is just basically a natural path. It's um, a road. It's a highway side. It's a crossroads that takes you from one field. It's the road that takes you from one field to the next. It's not necessarily the soil or the field that is being planted and cultivated and nurtured and all that kind of stuff. It's the, it's the soil that goes, it's the path that goes to those fields. <clears throat> it's a familiar path. It's been trampled on. It's been hardened through feet through animals through wagons or whatever trucks whatever you want to say uh, but it's still worthy for the sower to scatter that seed otherwise he wouldn't have written in three of the four gospels a lot of times we tend to think that oh i'm just not that one forget that one uh, oh, i don't want to be that one i know someone who's hard like that i know someone who's been trampled on but actually you and i are all of them Anybody ever been hardened by the things of this world? Right? Been hurt by the things of this world? We're going to the field. We're going to the harvest. We're going, you know, to the, to the planter's field. And stuff happens. Life happens. And we begin to get hardened in life. Our hearts begin to get hardened. It's a familiar path. The primary function of a wayside <clears throat> path is to create a path so that the sower can get to that field. And it takes a miracle. Say miracle. miracle. It takes a miracle for a seed to produce in that type of soil. Takes a what? Miracle. But miracles still happen, Amen. right? Amen. Miracles still happen. And I think that's one of the reasons. And you know what? I had never seen that. I had never seen that. I woke up in the middle of the night. It's like, oh, thank you, Lord. Hmm. This is fresh out of the oven. Fresh out of my spirit. You know, my best messages come when I'm asleep. Because everything's quiet. And all of a sudden, he wakes me up. It's like, oh, yeah, I get that. I get that. I'll study it tomorrow. Or sometimes I just don't. And that is like, where are you going? Because I got I to gotta get this. I got to put this down. And so the wayside soil is a very important part of this parable. Why? Because you and I have to understand that we will find ourselves in that wayside space Various seasons in our lives. True. True. So what do you do? Here's what most of us do. Nothing. We just let the raven come. I can't get this mouth to open. <laughs> it's not going to open, right? Nope, it won't open. We let them peck on the seed. God's sending people. He's sending amazing Mexican pastors to sow seed into your heart. You come into this place, it's like, man, I just got to be, I just got to hear God. I just got to do something. And so we're scattering seed 
in the space of your hardened place in life. But as soon as you get out of here, you're fighting. As soon as you get out of here, something's happening. You allow the thing to uh, steal the seed from your heart. And then you come back next Sunday and do it over again. You know what I do with ravens? I kill them. <laughs> they come and they mess up my seed, my garden. They mess up my flowers. They do all kinds of stuff. I didn't know that ravens, like, they're like, they're like gang members. <laughs> Seriously, like, they talk to each other. Because I, I killed one. I was like, I shot that thing with a pellet gun, and he's dead. Well, all the cousins didn't like it. Because anytime I go outside, seriously, I'm not lying. Anytime I go outside, you hear, paca, paca. it's like, these, they're way over there across the field. Like, there he is, there he is. Stay away. Seriously. Right, babe? Constantly. It's like, Marcus, they know you. I was like, I know. I'm going to shoot them again. I've been looking for like a hundred. Anyways, just, I'm getting distracted. It's a hundred round BB gun. It's just this, but it just... Just hard to find. <laughs> the common translation to this particular parable a lot is the wayside soil are individuals who are hard of hearing. They've hardened their heart. Anybody ever hear that? They become cold. They become distant. They become uh, people with no affection. They have no compassion towards others. They're guarded people. They're just distant. Why? Because They've been trampled on. I mean, they trusted the sower. They thought they trusted the seed. And when they went along the path, they got trampled on. And not necessarily by ravens or whatever, but by other people who were part of the farm. They gotten hurt and they gotten burned. And so now they're suspicious and they're cautious. And they don't open up their hearts anymore. And so little by little... They've closed this path, and it's become stony, hard ground in life. When I met Natalie, um, she was coming out of a swimming pool. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> she was. It was beautiful. Bo Derek. Anyways, I was like, I need to see her. Met her, got to know her a little while, and she was just a beautiful, and still is, smiling, rejoicing, laughing, a beautiful young 13-year-old. <laughs> 13, right? And so as we got a connecting, uh, started connecting more, I began to, uh, you know, touch her face. That's all I touched, I promise. <laughs> and I don't know how she got pregnant. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but I, I touched her, and whenever I would get close to her face, she would be like, don't touch me. I was like, I, I love you. I, it's like, I love you. Don't touch my face. It's like, okay, what can I touch then? <laughs> oh, I didn't mean it that way. I just meant <laughs> This is not a marriage seminar, okay? It's not a marriage message. But I realized that she had a wound. I didn't know what it was. But now we understand it. We've addressed it. And, and it's still, even after this many years, every now and then, though, that's a trigger point. It's an association for whatever took place in her life. Make sense? But now, even though she hurts deeply, she loves just tremendously. She's allowed the seed of God's word to break that follow ground, to break that hardened ground in her life. And she loves hard. She hurts deep, but she loves hard. And I love that about her. And it's the same thing in different areas in my life. So you and I have to allow the God's word, the God's word, God's word to heal those wounds from the past. Right. It's only God's word. See, Therapists, like I love the doctors. I love that whole field because I believe in them a lot. I think it's God, they're God's specialists in certain areas. But there are only certain things that need the laser beam of God's word to touch that no man can touch. Yes, so you have to put yourself in a position to allow him to do that work on the inside, right? Amen. Allow it to break that hard ground. We've all been there. Now, there's some obstacles that we can see e easily in scripture regarding this wayside or this wayward soil. First of all, if we're not careful, our soil will become, our heart will become hardened 
and more hardened and, and will become more suspicious of individuals and will not allow individuals uh, or even ourselves reading God's word will not allow the seed of God's word to penetrate those areas in our heart that he wants to heal. So that seed becomes just bait for Satan. God wants to pull on us, but it hurts still that we just like push that down and allow this dead bird to rise up and come peck at that area in your life. There comes a time when you just got to just shoot these things, get rid of them. Poor bird. Little did Amazon know. You know what? I don't want this thing on my pulpit. <clears throat> but there are obstacles. And we have to be careful not to allow those things um, to take root. And you become a hardened individual and never get fully healed and whole as a follower of Christ. It says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart, not some of your heart, all of it. Lean not on your own understanding. Acknowledge him in all your ways. And he will help you. He will direct your path, right? Mm -hmm. There's also, with every obstacle, there's different opportunities, too, that this way -soiled, uh, wayside soil has. The opportunity, first of all, is this, is that <laughs> Satan knows the potential of that seed. That's what he's trying to do. As the seed's being sown in there, all Satan wants to do is to abort the process that that, that seed needs to go through in order for you to become stronger and healed right. and whole. He wants to abort it. He's always doing the abortion thing. And you know what? We're doing the abortion thing too. How? God's seeding us, and we're not allowing that seed to take full form. We abort that thing. Because we don't know what to do. That thing gets birthed. We put fingers out there on all the abortion things, and believe me, and listen, I, I'm, I'm all for that too. But we have to be careful that we're not the ones aborting what God wants to give birth to in our own hearts, in our lives. Does that make sense? Not only as an individual, but as a family. I mean, there are certain things that Natalie and I, if we're not on the same page, we'll abort God's plan for our lives in certain areas of our lives because we're just f focusing on, you know, our faces are the enemy. We have to come to terms, learn how to compromise, learn how to love each other, even though we don't like each other sometimes, and learn, hey, this is bigger than us. Right. And let God have full control or full, we yield to him fully so that we can produce what he wants us to produce on this earth, in this, in this place. Amen? So that's an opportunity. And Satan knows the power and the potential in that seed. My question is, do you know that? Do you know how much, you know, in the very beginning, Genesis, uh, God told, he reminded Satan after, you know, he uh, deceived Eve. He goes, hey, because of this, I'm taking you back to the dirt. You're going to slither around that dirt. And I'm going to put hatred between your seed and her seed or my seed. You know, he was talking about himself. And so all this time, even up until this moment right now, as there is there's animosity, there's enmity there. And since the very beginning, he's, he, the Lord told him, he goes, hey, this seed will crush your head. I'm going to give you an opportunity to bruise his heel, but he's going to crush your head. And so the time came, is this the one? Is this the one? No, that's Elijah. Is this the one? No, this is Moses. Is this the one? No, this is Jacob. Who is this? Is this the one here? Is this the one that's going to crush my head? You see that throughout all of Scripture. All of a sudden, Jesus comes in. It's like, that's the one. Man, this is a guy. I'm not only going to bruise his heel. I'm going to bury him. So he scourges him. He beats him. He drives him to the ground. He buries him for three days. And even though Jesus felt like Man, I'm dying here. Lord, why have you forsaken me? Even though he felt like he was being buried and he was in the darkest hour where he no longer had the father with him, he wasn't being buried. He was actually being planted. Mm. He was being planted because three days later he would rise again. Amen. And many of us understand that concept. 
because we've been there. We've been the wayward soil, and we felt like we were buried. But in the middle of that dark space, God spoke, and he breathed, and he said, live. Come back alive. Anybody been there? I've been there. So that's one of the opportunities of this wayward soil. Not only does the enemy understand the potential of the seed, you have to understand it. Sometimes he understands more the potential in this seed than his sons and daughters do. That's true. That's why I encourage you as a follower, as a pastor, man, just you've got to plant this seed. Well, I don't understand it. It doesn't matter. Just keep planting. I promise you. It will bear fruit in its season. The second opportunity is if this seed perhaps somehow or another breaks through that hard ground while some were meaning to crush it and trample on it, somehow there's a gap there and some of that seed goes in there, that's all the seed needs in order for it to begin to produce or to go through this process, right? The enemy meant something bad for you in certain areas in your life. You felt bruised and beaten. You felt trampled on, and it's, you're disgusted by it. But man, God was on the other side. He's like, he didn't cause that, but he'll use it. All you need to do is open up a little crack of that hardened soil, let a piece of that seed come in, he'll begin to water it. And while you're in there buried, you're wondering, it's like, what's going on? I thought I would trust you, and you're crying, you're crying. Anybody ever been in a place of crying? Like, oh, God, what the heck's wrong with me? What's wrong with you? I thought I did this. I did that. Little did you know that those tears that you and I were shedding would become the water to seed that soil. That is good. And it would take fruit. It would start working. You've got to go through the process. That's why this ministry is here. The Lord showed us when we came back from Ramah in 1992 that we would primarily be restoring people back to a place of health and strength. Little did I know of all that entails. <laughs> but some of us, when we find people in this hard, rough soil and ground, we stay away from them. Well, that's a hard criminal there. You know that guy that runs sound back there? His name's Matt, and he's a, he just came out of prison. He, he didn't. I'm just saying that. And his girlfriend came out of prison, too. Sometimes we come in, and we have guys that go, man, I love your church. They're like, why? He goes, I'm sitting next to a tattooed guy with, with tattoos on his face. I'm like, that's why you love the church? Because it's just so cool. I'm like, man, that's so awesome that you guys are not judging people because everyone who walks through these doors is all level at the foot of the cross. So I love that about you guys. It's a reflection of God's working, a deep work in your heart. Keep doing that. Keep doing that. Because it's important for us to be able to speak into those hardened soils and speak and scatter the seed of God's word into those places to see God do the miracle. You can't do the miracle. You're not that good. But he can. Come on. That's right. So all we need is an opportunity, and that's the opportunity. You may be hardened by life's hurt, but you're not forgotten by God's hand. That's so good. He loves you enough. He's not going to keep you there. He's not going to leave you there. So many examples in Scripture about people who've made mistakes, people who knew God. It's hot in here, isn't it? <clears throat> people who've, who've been burned and been hurt. And they've made mistakes and they've allowed um, the pressure, the stuff that's happened to them, harden their hearts and they're no longer open. They, they're, they're keeping it to themselves. Israel, children of Israel. Man, they were delivered by God's hand, but they forgot who delivered their, th them from that. Remember that? But they had mercy. God had mercy on them when they repented, when they cried out. God had mercy on them, correct? The prodigal son. Man, he's in the house. Him and his brother, they're doing good. They can do everything. They, I mean, they got everything. The farm's great. Everything's good. The guy decides to go take some of his inheritance, and he forgets. And while he's in the middle of a dirt, among the pigs, he remembers. He made a mistake. The beautiful thing is that even though in the middle of the mistake, the father was still there 
ready to receive him back and restore him to a better place. You and I, you can put your name in it. I can put my name in it. It was in a little apartment in Seguin Manor Apartments in government housing that I was the worst hardened person on this earth. I won't go into the details because many of you know it, but man, I'm not proud of any of the stuff that I went through. A hardened man. But all it took was a Saturday morning for someone to have um, the courage enough to walk into my door and say, can you read this from this Bible? And when I read, before you call, I will answer. And while you're still speaking, I will hear. Little did I know that that word in a millisecond transformed and shattered this addiction that was in my soul. I mean, it was the seed, the laser beam of God's word and his spirit. These guys, they were Jehovah's Witnesses. They had no clue. They just saw a miracle happen. They didn't even know what the heck happened. <laughs> they came back, and I'm like a changed person. They're like, what happened to you? It's like, you, I don't know what happened. It just came from this book. Then they blacklisted us two weeks later. They brought the main guy from that place to Kingdom Hall place to my house. And I told him, I shared the gospel with him. Like, who's teaching you this? Like, dude, it's right here. It's right here in this Bible. I'm telling you. And it's like, we're going to have to blacklist you. It's like, what is that? He goes, we can't come here anymore. It's like, that's okay. I said, this is working. I'm good. <laughs> and it's still working. <laughs> and to be honest with you, man, it still comes from this book. It still comes from this book. I'm not tired of the simplicity of opening up this Bible and just reading a passage Listen, a sower sows and just get full. How much should I read, Marcus, till you're full? Sometimes I read one word, I'm full, because he just begins to process, begins to do stuff. Sometimes I read a whole chapter. Sometimes I read a whole book. It doesn't matter. I just read until I get full because I know that this is the strength that I need. And sometimes we become so hardened that we become wayside soil. So you don't have to shame yourself if you're finding yourself in that space right now. You're okay. Because God put this wayside soil in here for a reason. He still does miracles in soil like this. You guys ever hear about the girl who made a mistake? She goes to confession. And he tells the father, bless me, father, for I have sinned. What is it, my child? I've committed the sin of vanity. Twice a day I gaze in the mirror and I tell myself how beautiful I am. And the priest turns around and looks at the girl and goes, my dear, I have good news. That's not sin. You just made a mistake. (laughs) Somebody got it. We make mistakes. Proverbs, the 28th chapter, quote the scripture. It says, he who covers his sin, he won't prosper. But whoever confesses and forsakes him will have mercy. Happy is the man who is always reverent, but he who hardens his heart will fall into calamity. Remember this idea. A seed that's being planted looks no different than a seed that's being buried. You have to decide. You might feel, but you are not your feelings. You are not your emotions. You are a spirit. And God speaks to you through his word. And his word is spirit and it's life. (laughs) And so you have to be able to hear his voice. You have to decide, Lord, I feel like I'm being buried, but I realize that I'm just being planted. Because your hand is still here with me. You might feel like a burial is taking place, But you and I have to understand that we are being planted by God Almighty himself. None of us should have been here. But for the grace of God who spoke to us in the moment when you and I were in wayside soil. But for the mercy and grace of God. Those that are planted in the house of the Lord, they will flourish, the scripture says. Right? They have to reframe and think that they they are being planted. And if you're being planted, the reason, the reason why God's planting you 
is because you're going to go in, but you're going to come back out a different person. You'll never come out a different person unless you're willing to go into that dark place. Jesus, Luke's gospel, the fourth chapter, it says right when he was going to enter ministry, the Lord, the Spirit of God led him into the wilderness, into the dirt, into the sand, into that dark place. It was there that he confronted the devil. He overcame the devil through the word of God. And it says when he got out, he got out in the power of the Spirit. He had to go through the process. Why should we be any different as his sons? If the master had to go through it, we're going to have to go through it as well, right? I love how God does these things. You see, when I was being shamed in front of thousands of people on a pulpit, I thought I was being buried. But God would use that moment to plant something in me that I could never get unless I've gone through that process. It was through that burial that I became a better pastor. Some of the stuff you're going through, you feel like you're being buried and it's in a dark place. But I want you to reframe this week and say, you know what? I'm being planted by God. You sat in that courtroom wondering how you're going to provide for your kids because your husband is no longer going to be providing for you. You feel like you're being buried in that courtroom and the judge is on his side. You're not being buried, you're being planted. You're going to rise up again in Jesus' name. You might have sat there and listened to that doctor say to you, you only have so much to live. You'll never have children. You'll never, you know, get to this place because your son now has cancer or leukemia or whatever it is. You feel like your whole world's caving in. But I want you to know you're not being buried. You're being planted. God will use it to transform you, to metamorphose you into a different person, into a whole different framework. You're coming back. You're on your way back up. You're on your way back out. You will live again. You will rise again. Why? Because that's what God's word does. And so that's the fight. The fight is to remain in faith in those dark places. Real quick, and I'll close. Abraham was given a covenant by God Almighty. He was given a promise. Remember the, the promise that God gave Abraham that you're going to have seed, man, thousands. Count the stars. You're going to have that much seed. How can I do that? I'm 100 years old. But that was the promise that God gave. It was the seed that he was sowing um, into his life in that moment. It was, God, how do I know this? How, 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 am I, how can I have an assurance of this? And he gave him a, a, a system. He, he told him to, to get some animals and make a sacrifice. He says, get these animals, split them in half, and lay them in the dirt. So he places these animals in the dirt. Read it, Genesis 15. And so while he's sitting there, God says, I'm going to come and I'm going to consume that altar. I'm going to consume that sacrifice. And there will I establish my covenant with you. I'm sowing the seed so that you can understand that I am with you. You know what happened right when he laid that, those animals in the dirt? The scripture says, Paco, Paco. The vultures came to go and try to take away and eat away at the sacrifice that was meant to be a covenant. Why? Because Satan immediately comes to steal the seed that God is planting. What does the scripture say Abraham did? It says he drove them away. He drove them away. He drove them away. He got rid of them. Just like you and I, you have to have some effort. You have to have some uh, on the inside of you to sit there and say, hey, no, man, how many times, Natalie, have we woken up two or three, four, five in the morning when our kids are two, three, four, five, seven years old and they're sick and they got fever and all this stuff's happening? We're like, no, devil. This covenant has been established in my household. Me and my house will serve you no matter what hell or high water comes in. We would speak God's word. We would walk around the room. We would get oil, start anointing the whole house with oil. Just because we didn't know what the heck we were doing. We were just like, man, God, you're with me. You're not against me. I'm not being buried. These kids will not go down that path. We will rise up and serve you no matter what takes place in our lives. Sometimes you got to drive it away because Satan has no shame in trying to take that seed and steal from you. Does that make sense? 
Psalms 126. I'll close with this. <clears throat> and now God, do what? Do it again. I love this passage. Bring the rains to our drought-stricken lives. Anybody feel drought-stricken? Anybody feel dry in this place? Here's the prayer. Bring those rains, bring refreshing to these drought-stricken lives so those who planted their crops in despair will shout yes at the harvest. Those who went off with heavy hearts carrying seed to sow will come home rejoicing with armloads of blessings. God always takes the things that seem like they're burying you and cause you to rise up in those moments and actually you're being planted. So this week, take a picture of this or somehow or another, make sure that you birth this thing in your spirit. You got to say to yourself, I am not being buried. I am being planted. When you're facing that dark space, when you're facing that ugliness, you've got to say, I'm not being buried. I mean, I'm not being, I'm being planted here. This is an opportunity for me to go through a process and get over on to the other side where I need to be. And then the second thing is this, take that rock. You know, I didn't even ask you, if you didn't get a rock, there's some rocks somewhere. Just pick one up somewhere. Put your name on one side of that rock. And the reason I said put your name on this right side of the rock is because, hey, there's no name on here. Can I have your rock? It's Natalie. The reason why I want you to put your name on there is to remind you and I how hard at one time you were. So we can't be pointing any fingers to anybody. This reminds me how God spoke to me in the middle of my hard, hardest place in life. And the second side, I want you to put a name, whatever name, you might know a friend, you might know a loved one, someone that's close, you know that they've fallen prey to this wayside soil. They've hardened their heart, they've been burned by life, stuff's happened. And I want you to put their name on there because I need you to pray for them. I need you to just encourage them somehow, sometime or another. Now, when you walk out of this place today, you can do one of two things. Either take it home, put it on your shelf or whatever as a reminder, or just throw it over that bridge. I see that. I go by that bridge a lot. I pray along those lines. There's, cra- there's, there's ravens there all the time. But I go by there and I'll, wa- I'll see. Sometimes I'll walk in there and I'll pick up the old rocks. We've done this before years ago. I'll pick up old rocks and I begin to pray for the names that are on there. As a matter of fact, you don't know this, underneath all of this ca- carpet, uh, on the backside of, of the paint, on these walls, all over this building, are the names of individuals who've been hardened by the things in life. Your friends, your loved ones, your grandparents, your uncles, your aunts, when we did this church, we painted, we just went all around and just put the names of city officials, everyone that we knew was lost, that needed a touch from God, as a reminder that these walls are breathing the breath of life into those who do not know him, those who have fallen on wayside soil. And we believe God will do the increase. God will do the work. Amen? Amen. Did you get something out of that? All right, let's pray. Father, you're so good to us. We're so thankful for what you're doing. We all know uh, people that are close to us, that are precious to you, and they're precious to us, who've been burned by life. And we know also, Lord God, that it's not hopeless. It might seem like wayside and it's burned and they've been trampled on and we don't even know how. But God, you're the miracle working God. We have to trust you. And I just pray, Lord God, that you would help us to become the healing vessel that you want us to become to restore people's lives. And for us that are in this place and we've been broken ourselves, we find ourselves in this place now, ask that you would just breathe, touch us, restore us, Make us whole again, we pray in Jesus' name. And everyone that agreed with that said amen. God bless you guys. We love you. Next week, we're going to be talking about getting stoned. All right? If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.